Um, so I know I can't see most of you, but if you wouldn't mind standing with me, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you want, and we'll do the pledge together. Hope I can get myself back here. Okay, I pledge my head to clear <laughs> thinking, my <laughs> heart to greater <laughs> loyalty, my hands to larger <laughs> service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Thank you, Ali, for joining in, and everyone else who I'm sure did it with their screens off and um, for the Lake Lion judging team. Okay, so uh, my name's Madeline Left. Sorry, I didn't change my name on here. Um, but I am one of 4-H Alberta's uh, provincial program coordinators. Um, I'm just here to go through a few slides and um, talk about our provincial judging competition that's coming up and then um, we're going to pass it over to the Lakeland judging team to run this awesome session today. So um, I, this is just a reminder for those of you who don't know um, that you can register for the 4-H provincial judging competition that's coming up really soon on March 10th um, at Lakeland College in Vermilion. So, um, this is for 4-H members, even if you haven't judged before, although because this is the advanced session, I'm assuming most of you have. Um, so it's, uh, you'll go kind of over everything um, and it's going to be a really fun activity. Um, it's going to be a great day. I was there last year. It's super fun. So if you haven't gone, definitely register. Um, again, the registration deadline is March 1st. So that's also coming up really quickly. Um, because February is a short month, as we all know. Um, so then just some more details about this that you can register as an individual. And if you do, you'll be placed with a team or you can register as a team. Um, you'll need to find four people for your team and they should all be around the same age. Um, but if you choose to have someone in a different age category, you will uh, compete in the older oldest members category. Um, so if you had seniors and intermediates, you'd be competing with the seniors. Um, there is a team price for when you register. And as a team, you'll do all the judging and your scores will be added together and then you'll win prizes as a team. Um, you also compete as an individual, um, but you only have to pay one fee. And so then, um, so when you look, you'll be able to see a team price and an individual price. But if you pay your team price, you don't have to pay the individual price. Um, and if you can't find someone to come with you, uh, that's okay too. You can compete with the other members um, and there will be individual awards too. So don't worry, just sign up even if you don't have a team. Um, winners in the senior category are gonna have the opportunity to attend the Western Canadian Judging Competition um, in Regina at Agribition. And that's on November 19th to 22nd this year. So um, you have the potential to win that opportunity, which is also really cool. Um, the what it'll look like for the schedule on March 10th, uh, 8.30 is your registration at Lakeland College. Nine is when judging is going to begin. Um, so even if your seniors still come at nine because there's still things to do starting at nine, juniors and intermediates will judge and give reasons um, seen following the classes and there's six of them. And then the seniors will judge in the morning and then they'll do the reasons in the afternoon and there's eight classes for that. Um, and all of your reasons are going to be given orally, so there won't be any written ones. Um, and then at 5.30, there's the banquet and the awards um, at the Vermilion Curling Club, which is, if you haven't been to Vermilion, it's all kind of there. <laughs> so um, you should definitely register. And um, again, I'm going to say it again because it's on the slide. March 1st is the registration deadline, so make sure right after this you go and register if you haven't. Um, and again, I want to just thank the Lakeland judging team for being here and helping to make this opportunity uh, fantastic for you guys and um, also just to encourage you to go to these cool provincial activities or to just do the judging events in your regions. Um, it's a super cool opportunity. So thank you to the Lakeland judging team. Uh, and then my final thank yous before we get started are just uh, to thank our supporters. Um, and as we all know that uh, the 4-H Alberta supporters and our sponsors are what make these opportunities possible for everybody. Um, so if you see anyone from uh, these organizations out in the community, make sure that you thank them. Um, so thank you to our Diamond Clover sponsor, the Government of Alberta. 
And, oh, sorry, my screen froze. Okay, thank you to our Emerald Clover sponsor, Alberta Recycling, Ulta Link, ATB, Calgary Stampede Foundation, um, Chartered Professional Accountants, UFA. And thank you to our Gold Clover sponsors, Brent, AFSC, or no, sorry, our Gold Clover sponsors, AFSC, and our Silver Clover sponsors, Brant, Save on Foods, and Wolf Carbon Solutions. And then, final thank you to our Bronze Clover, Alberta Beef Producers, Bayer, Gas Alberta Inc., Lakeland College, MCS Net, Nutrien, PV Mart, and Viterra. Special shout out to Lakeland College, um, 4H Canada, and our 4H Canada national partner, Bayer. So, thank you to our sponsors for your support. And I guess that is my last slide. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Uh, I'll let the Lakeland team introduce themselves to everyone. Uh, but um, if you guys have any questions, you can type them in the chat um, and we'll be monitoring them. And if you're having tech issues, just uh, message me directly and I can try and help you out. Um, but if you have to leave and come back in, I'll be monitoring the waiting room. So you should be good with that. Okay. That's enough of me talking, so I will pass it over to the Lakeland team. Okay, <clears throat> so we just got a little presentation here put it together here, but this was introduce ourselves first. So you guys go first. Uh, I'm Casey Thompson. I'm Carter Wood. And then I'm, I'm Will Bradford. Mm -hmm. We'll be uh, doing a little session for you guys today, or tonight, I guess. Uh, we just kind of put some, some stuff together that we thought would be kind of good to go over for, for everybody. So if I know how to get to the next slide, just space bar, click. Okay, there we are. So for tonight, we thought we'd go over some horse or equine, some beef, some dairy, and some sheep terminology. Um, some transition words and then work, work on a little bit of comparisons and stuff like that. And there'll be a, I think we got a couple of classes kind of for you guys, maybe the judge, you can guys put your placings or something in the comments and we get to that point. So I guess uh, let's keep going here. Oh, there's one. So I guess we'll start off with the equine terminology here. If you guys have any questions, don't be afraid to pop them in the chat or something like that. Um, so I guess we'll start with the with a horse here. Um, horse should be balanced like anything. To me, they should be proportionate in their in the way they look, like their head and their center body, and their and their um, their hind quarters should all be roughly the same. Um, and then I'm, I'm just knowing horses, you got to make sure they're like structurally sound is one of the major things, depending on what kind of horse. If you're judging heavy horses or light horses, but they should all be structurally correct in the way they put their feet on the ground. So that's something. Guys should look for. Um, they should be, you know, they should still be like attractive, and they should like horses should have some muscle shape too, because that's where all your power comes from when you're riding, um, or if you're like if you're pulling a wagon, or if you're roping calves, or just doing ranch work. You need a horse that has some go. Um, so like, let's look at quality. Like, look at the head, neck, and hair coat. Like, normally a good animal, you can kind of determine it's healthy by the way it looks in its eyes or it hits hair coat. Um, and then like we have it's an animal that's just an attractive head. So like you don't want like a Roman nose or just like a or like pig eyed or something like that. Like you want a horse with like good, good or good created skull and has some look and some, you know, something that you'd want to look at, like kind of what the horse diagram here says. Um but yeah, like they should have some then we'll move down to muscling. They should have some forearm muscle there along the shoulder. And then the stifle and then the gaskin and the stifle muscles are pretty good indicators of muscle shape, how much power they have. Um, but yeah, like and then when you take step back and look at the real picture, they should all just kind of go together. Um, but yeah, like make sure you look at structure to correct angles. Of course, should have a good angle that's pasturing. Uh, you get if you get animals that have a too much of an angle, you'll see they don't have quite as strong strong tendons and their pasturing angles and stuff like that. And you see animals that kind of break down. So you want to get still a strong pasturing, but at the same time, you still want some flex in there. So that's, you know, if you're riding a horse, you need to be smooth. You don't want to be bumping all over the place at the same time. And some flex, like in a, like in a beef cow too, they just got some flex in there. The way they put their foot on the ground, but 
Um, if you guys have any questions, we have some in the chat here. <clears throat> oh, there's no questions yet. So we'll get rid of that. Okay. Um, but if you guys have any questions right now, you guys can throw some questions in the chat or something if you want. We'll give you a minute or two if you want to take a look at the at the horse diagram there and get some of the terms that are on that uh, on that diagram. If you guys have anything to say, no, we covered it all. Already. Okay, so yeah, I'll just any questions. Just you can even turn on your mic and say it too. Like, there's only there's enough of us here that we can just do that. So. Anyways, so we're getting any questions here. We'll go to the next slide. And if you got a question about horses, just pop it up again. So we got some phrases here, um, like smoother, more refined, more athletic, ties more correctly, higher quality of bone, like moves freer, shows more flexion in the hawks, um, deeper heart girth. So yeah, just like take a look at some of those, some of those phrases there, and you can put them into your reasons. So if you want to just take a picture with your phone or something, maybe even. Um, those are some pretty good phrases you put into your reasons and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> I think we'll just kind of keep moving on here. Go to horse or whatever next. Let's go to beef peppers. So, this is where the three of us probably have more expertise is in beef animals. Uh, we all three of us grew up showing and judging cattle. Um, so, I'm sure you'll get input from all, all three of us on this one. So. And you guys want to start off the heifers? Yeah, I guess in terms of beef heifers, um, we have to remember we're not looking at a market animal, but they are still something that's going to go out and lay down and calve and raise a market animal one day. So we are still looking at some muscle, but we're more focused on structural correctness and more productivity than product compared to like a market steer where we're looking at more um, end product. On a heifer, we're going to look at functionality and product productivity. So with that comes structure. We're going to put a lot more emphasis on structure and correct angles and feet and legs. Um, as we get into more bred heifers and like as these females get a little more mature, put a little bit more weight into some other structure and stuff. Um, the way their shoulder their angle or shoulder, I want them to get out and move and flex and be attractive on the move. We don't want them to get all humped up in their spine when they move. I want them to be level in their hip when they move and flexible in their hawk, uh, flexible in the, on the front end too, right? Um, in terms of volume, we like these cattle big ribbed and bold ribbed when you get behind them because that's where a lot of your, uh, what we call like an easy doing cattle, um, that's where that comes from is from them being having some capacity and some mass and some volume. I think that's pretty important in terms of breeding animals. Um, femininity, uh, a lot of that you can read in terms of kind of their muscle pattern and then up through the front one third of their body too, right? Like we don't want a great big leg like a, like a steer under these heifers all the time. Uh, we want them to be a little bit more feminine and refined in their bone structure. Want them to be a little bit cleaner through their front end and not masculine in their skull, right? We want them to be a little bit cleaner in their throat and stuff. Um, so that's kind of all about femininity. Um, muscling, like I said before, um, these aren't market animals, but we have to think of them that one day she's going to lay down and she's going to calve and ideally raise a market animal. So they do need to still have some muscle. Uh, they do need to still have some power and some hip and stuff. But that doesn't need to be the main focus where it does like in a market steer. It's not quite the same. Uh, we're gonna put a little different weight on that in terms of the market animal compared to a breeding heifer. So yeah, like like you said, you want them stout pinned, like that's where your calving ease will come from. And like animals that are narrow when they're pin set, you know, are not gonna have the rib shape or the mass down their top line. So like Stouter pin, the more functionality they're going to have, um, the more volume you're probably going to see throughout their whole body. Like this heifer in a diagram, me, like that doesn't, that's not a lot of depth of body. Like that's pretty, it's pretty almost like a tube. Um, like we want to see some sweeper rib and stuff like that. 
Um, but just, you know, that's a pretty good diagram though for looking at um, like traits or terms and stuff like that. But like, yeah, he wants some sweep of sweep of body and stuff like that too. So um, I think he kind of covered it all. Like you want him attractive. And yeah, in terms, I guess I kind of missed like in terms of structure, there's a few way, different ways to evaluate structure. And probably the easiest is when cattle are on the move, right? Uh, if they're flexible and they're hitting their track and stuff, odds are pretty good that they're sound as long as they're like keeping their spine together when they move. Um, another way to look at some structure is either look at them head on or when they're going away from you. Like if they get where they're rolling out like this, probably not ideal, right? They're probably a little bit more shoulder than we need in these heifers. Um, or if they're turned in, the same thing, or turned out, obviously um, not ideal. We want them putting that foot down square and straight. So otherwise you'll see them wearing their hook down incorrectly. Like you'll see cattle kind of rolling and they'll be narrow on their one claw. Yeah, a lot of the time you go out in the pasture and you find one that's you don't doesn't think have a good foot. It probably relates back to a structure issue somewhere. It's up right. in their hip or in their shoulders. So, um, you got any questions? Say something or put something in the chat. Want to want to know anything? So, um, yeah, you can take a look at that uh, that diagram a little bit there. We'll just uh, move to the next slide. So now we're looking at now we're looking at the market animal steers. So now we're not looking at but what, it depends on what kind of steers are judging, whether you're judging fat steers or like a, a background steer or even a prospect steer. Um, if you depends on which stage you're looking at, if you're looking at like a prospect steer, you should have some frame and some ability to grow. Um, the muscling there, to put fat down onto a frame. Uh, you should have enough frame that you're going to ideally finish that steer like 13 or 1400 pounds. Um, that's when you're looking at prospect cattle. And when you're looking at finished cattle, then that's when you got to get your hands on them and you got to determine uh, the correct amount of finish for that animal. Um, they have to have enough, cut, enough cover of their ribs and they need an adequate amount of back fat. And that's because that all comes to your grading system and how the cattle are going to um, develop when they eventually get harvested. Um, but if you're judging feedlot steers or a show steer, there's always a little bit of different things. And show steer, you might want them to be a little more, more pretty because they are, at the end of the day, they are a show animal, but um, if you're lucky enough to judge, like, just, some, just a class of feedlot calves, that's when you get to judge the, you know, like, that's pretty much what the beef industry is, is looking at feedlot calves like that, and that's a pretty cool class, you know, get your hands on it, analyze, but, you know, we still, still want structure in, in market animals, because, and some people would say, oh, it's a steer, he doesn't need to have good structure, well, he's still in the feedlot pad, and starts to walk from the water bowl, the bedding pack, to the feed bunk, with all the weight he's gaining, like he still has to have the skeleton to put fat down on and put it in the adequate places on his body. And so he still needs that skeleton to carry that around, right? Um, don't ignore structure on market animals because it is still important. Um, but yeah, he's got to determine the right, um, the right type of fat on the animal, and that's your finish. And you got to remember that every animal, just like humans, we all put fat down differently. Um, so you'll see animals that you know, they'll put fat down in different areas of your body. Um, so, you know, that's where you just got to get your eyes and put your hands on them and determine what the adequate amount and then compare the other ones in the class. So um, it's, you know, they're still beef animals. So and that's where, you, where you're talking about the heifers where they need to have muscling and, you know, stout pin. Now we're going into calves. They should be stout pin. And that's where you're going to get the ability to, you know, finish at higher weights and, um, you know, have the, have the skeleton there and the muscle shape. So, I guess. Yeah, I think in terms of stoutness and muscle, like the stoutness piece is pretty important in terms of being able to put that muscle and that that end product down. If this, if we got one that's real narrow and doesn't really have a lot of base in terms of put muscle down, there's probably not as much end product as the stout pin one that's really opened up and stuff and has a lot more area to put muscle down. So that's pretty important in terms of structure and muscle and stuff like that in a market animal. Because at the end of the day, show steers, market steers, whatever they are, at the end of the day, they're going to be on a hook, and we need to look at them as such. Like, uh, I think the carcass kind of does need to take a lot of precedence in your mind when you're judging these cattle, because at the end of the day, that's what they are, especially when they're the fat cattle. You need to look at them like that's what they are, as if they're going to be killed tomorrow. So uh, you kind of focus on market readiness. Um, and we can evaluate market readiness 
Uh, we probably, I guess you guys, you probably judge too at 4 H shows. Usually you'll do like the class of market steers and somebody, the judge for the day will come out and talk to you about market readiness and how to determine which one's the most market ready. So I guess we'll just go over that quick. So market readiness um, mainly is determined by getting your hands on the cattle as well as a kind of visually evaluating them for fatness. So the number one place kind of that I was always taught to evaluate market readiness is to go put your hand down those cattle ribs and evaluate right to the 12th rib um, how fat they are. So um, you can kind of, if you get your hands on a fat steer compared to one that's not as fat, it's pretty easy to tell. But when there's four that aren't fat and you put your hands on all of them, you don't really know. So uh, you put your hands on a fat steer and at the right behind the shoulder, it should feel really squishy. And as you slide your hand down, you should feel some fat all the way down those ribs. And that probably means that he's pretty close to market ready or he probably is. So we don't want him open rib, which is when they don't, they're not fat back to that last rib. We want them with enough cover to be market ready so you can get a high quality uh, carcass when you when you hang them up. And you know, when they're finished, they'll be hard. Like those cattle will harden up on the last couple of weeks on feed there. Um, Cause that's what you want to do. Like when they're all jiggly still, what you want to do is you want to harden them up. And that's when you really know they are truly finished. They should, when you can analyze the back fat is like getting hard on the, on the muscle. And um, that's when you know they're, they're pretty close. So, um, I don't know, take a look at that. We've kind of been on this slide for a little bit. So I am just going to move to the next one here. So now we got looking at placement on the legs and you can probably use this chart when we go look at pigs or sheep, because it's the same thing. Like, you know, they shouldn't be bowed out in their knees. They shouldn't be knocked. Like one animal that should put his uh, right over the angle of his shoulder should come right down square on the ground. Um, but yeah, this it's all, every animal is the same, right? I mean, you have knock kneed horse, knock kneed sheep, you know, it's not all, all ideal. They just come out of the angle of their shoulder correctly, put their front foot on the ground. Whether it's a breeding heifer or a market steer, they all got to do it. Um, so, yeah, just, uh, here's the back legs. Same thing, you don't want to boat out, sickle hawk. Um, and then different breeds of cattle are more prone to, like you'll get some of cattle have a tendency to be in straighter in the angle of their hawk. And you'll see cattle that don't, they won't reach out and track. And the track is when the back foot of the animal fills a place to where the front foot was. And so, Straighter legged cattle will just be more constricted in their hip movement. And then take an Angus, there's more tendency to be more cow hawk and will have more angle. And that's not ideal either. You know, that's you're probably going to be more shallow heel. And that's when your foot, you know, too much flex in the hawk and that animal's going to put its foot down and you're going to have the toes kind of grow up underneath of it because it's not wearing its foot down correctly, right? Um, so that's what you want. You want to balance between the angle and straightness. So, um, yeah, especially on breeding females, right? You get cows that have too much angle, their feet blow out, and you have cows that are too steep and they don't travel and they, they don't last long enough. So we'll just uh, keep going next slide here. So here's some some phrases. Oh, yeah, chat. What's in the left? Why don't we see? That's a, that's a team thing. Oh. I don't know how to get rid of it. It's just there now. Oh, oh buddy. Where did, what do they do? I guess we got to go back to the presentation, I guess. <clears throat> I'll just have to crank through these slides to get back where I was. So there's some phrases for you guys. Again, you can take a picture of your phone. I'm not going to read them all off to you guys. Because we kind of, you know, talked about talked about them for quite a bit there. So mm -hmm. take a picture or something, you know, have a read over them, and you know, there's a pretty good phrase there. Putting your reasons it makes them more interesting to listen to. So keep going here. So dairy, so dairy cattle are not the same as beef cattle at all, right? Different product. Uh, we're producing milk now. We're not producing beef. But at the same time, a dairy cow should still have a lot of volume in their ribs. Like, same time, there's a, they're like they're a little similar in that way. And same in structure, you know, structure goes the same way. Um, those cattle need to walk in the barns. 
because those guys are on cement all the time, right? So you need cattle that are structurally the correct the same way as a beef animal. And then in terms of body shape, they still have lots of volume because these cows are eating, you know, a lot of feed to get the performance that they need to milk, 40 liters a day that they're getting out of these cows now. So they should have some rib shape and some body. But at the same time, we're not looking at muscling the same way because it's different. Like we want those cows putting all they have into producing milk. And so that's why there's a huge focus on the udder, right? Cattle with better, better, like udders that are have better ligaments in them are held better into the into the body are going to last longer like that udder should blend right into that belly line and then along with that you want, you want your teat teat size is also very important too like you don't want big teats that are going to you know cause problems on the milking machine or something like that so like your udder should be high in its suspension and then at the same time it should have a lot of volume right because that's you know that's what you're doing is increase milk so they kind of score themselves a little differently when you touch dairy cattle um, like the udder is obviously like that is the most when you're judging an animal and then the dairy traits like an animal I like to say an animal is very dairy like what I was always told that's kind of like when it was this, when if we talk about an animal being maternal and a beef animal like this is almost like the dairy's way of saying you know like she's has the dairy traits that are you know that's being like having that high mammary veins in her in her in her, in, in her underline sorry you know and having an attractive head that you know is nice to look at and stuff like that so uh, but yeah they should be level topped square of their pins and, and their hooks it's like similar to a beef animal in that way but you don't want them putting fat down as soon as they have any fat i mean it's just not producing milk she's putting her own condition down and that is a cow that's not being quite as effective as it's something else in her so um hey guys yeah i guess in terms of the other some things we're looking at when you get behind the a lactating dairy cow like we want to look at in terms of the attachment of the udder from behind how it goes up into their twist kind of between their back legs we want a high and wide attachment and then from the side we want them to blend that other like that four udder kind of into the belly and stuff we don't want it to be like same as on a beef cow right you see a big udder on a beef cow that's swinging down below our hawks that's probably not very ideal either so yeah, so we'll just move to the next next slide here. There's some dairy phrases, you know, stands taller in her in her shoulders, you know, longer four <coughs> blend smoother in her body wall, like we were kind of talking about there a little bit. Udder has more capacity, you know, more quality in the udder. Um just more balance or symmetry, stuff like that. So yeah, you're not judging anything on market. Cows are just strictly to produce milk. So. so now we're looking at sheep now. So uh you, you know, like there's some similar attributes that should be when you're looking at a, a heifer. Um like they should they should have structures one of the first things looking at a breeding animal. So same thing like we talked about I said those other slides you can use my sheep or pigs you know there should be the correct angle of the hawk um correct angle of the pasture and you know they should be attractive up to their head and neck. Um, so over the ribs of a sheep, it's called the rack. And you go in the, the back one third of the sheep, that's called the hind saddle and that includes the loin and into the dock, which is the tail. Um, so you want some capacity over their rack. It's a rib, they can some middle to them. And then you kind of want a, like a slight sweep of the body on their underline on a sheep. And then, you know, they have some muscle, like some shape. And then, a, yeah, big thing for me when I'm judging like smaller animals like sheep or pigs or goats, like is the foot quality, because that really kind of determines the longevity of the animal. And um, yeah, so structure, balance, yeah, they should be attractive, balance throughout the portions. And uh, you know, it's all comparable in a way. Just remember you're using sheep terms and not using the right, yeah, using the right terms. So. so now we look at our market lambs. So you compare them. Now you're looking at something getting hung on a hook again. So now you're looking at, you know, muscle shape and, and body. But I'm like a, like I'm like a finished steer, a lambs, like lambs don't finish the same way. Um, like you don't want them over fat because then that's all just trim. So you need to determine the right amount. Uh, I was always told when you use your hand. So if you take the back of your hand like this and you feel the ribs of a sheep, that means she's too, or that means the market lamb is too thick or too fat. If you take your knuckles and you feel like that, that means you're not finished. But if you take right here, right on your on your fist, 
and you should feel like a little bit on the ribs, but there's still some cover there. That's how they should feel on the market lamb. Because then you don't want them overfinished because that kind of the day is all trim and all gets trimmed off because they don't marble like a beef animal does. So, but again, look at structure again, because they do need to be able to get around and finish themselves. Um, you're still looking at body shape and muscling. And so you guys have anything to add there? No, it's similar. Like when you start thinking about a market animal, a lot of it is the same or it's similar at least. In a market animal, we're looking at like, just think about it logically, where does the best cuts come from? And that's where your, a lot of the focus in terms of muscle and stuff like that should be. Like in the steer, obviously a lot of that end product that's really high quality is coming from the top, from that loin of that animal and kind of in there. So we're going to kind of look in there and find a lot of value in there. Where a lamb, kind of like the same, right? The loin and over their hip and stuff. So like a market animal is pretty easy to evaluate just sit, down, sit back and think about what the carcass is and what they're supposed to be when you hang them up. Yeah. So. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Some sheep phrases. See, yeah, most massive over the rack. That's the ribs. Um, yeah, like you just don't want muscle shape and some body. So I'll just take, you can take a picture of those phrases. So I will keep going here. And um, what transition words can you think of? So I guess we do a brainstorming session. So does anybody know what the transition, transition word is? So this is where I need some interaction. Anybody, kids, any members? You guys can say, it's, turn your mic and shout something out. And then we'll kind of talk about it. I got for transition words connecting one phrase to another. And that's kind of a smooth way that sounds good. I like to use kind of however, we're getting some activity. Therefore, there you go, that's a good one. You use it, therefore this animal has higher amounts of finish, or you know, therefore this animal, it's a good, that's a good word. Furthermore, there you go, that's another one. Furthermore, this animal is stouter pin, she's better. Furthermore, you know, that's, not, that's a good one. You can use that to push home a phrase. We got, these guys got good, lots of good ones. Eh? Mm -hmm. Do too. Granted or although, yeah. Granted, although, accepted, or you accept, or something like that. That's all really good. In addition. Okay, so there you go. You guys got some, some transition words there. Appreciate. I don't know if appreciate's maybe a transition word quite the same, because you still appreciate something, but you're not gonna use that to slide to the next sentence. Along with, there you go, that's a good one. Okay. You guys can keep putting those in there and I'm just gonna go in the next slide here. So here you go. Yeah, you guys had furthermore, additionally, as well. I grant, recognize, I admit, as I move to. So, you know. In other words, one is overwhelming, overwhelmingly more superior in something. You know, runs through the top of the class, two ends of the class quite handily, or is undoubtedly the best. Um, you know, we in this class with the one one animal. So. We got some horse comparisons here to look at. So who is the heaviest muscled horse in this picture? So we'll just from left to right, just chestnut, and then we'll be one, and then you go down the line there. One, two, three. So let's keep it for I had a pole there. What did I do? Oh, you're muted there. I can't hear you. That was me. I'm sorry. I just I have these poll questions, but they only the one I just put only has like option A or B. But I'm not sure if that's for later. So if you have questions at some point that let them choose, I have okay. polls for that. Okay. I guess we'll just talk about it. I think some kids are chatting here. On okay, that's it. Okay. Oh yeah. <coughs> the third horse. Everybody thinks the third horse. There's one person. You're probably right. 
on that one. At the most definition, right? So. Now we got some beef. Who has the most bone? I got a thing on the way here. There we go. Who has the most bone and out of this picture? Or who has the least amount of bone? Let's go with that first. One, two, three, or four. You guys say who has the least amount. Just by looking at that picture. Get any chats. <clears throat> One. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Okay, so now what do you guys think is the biggest bow and animal in there? One, two, three. One, two, three. One, we have about two, two, two as well as muscle. Okay. Two again, you guys. That's what we thought too. Those are the two half random most bone. Um, in terms of the most muscle, the flat. Uh, I was gonna say a three after probably has the most. The flat is made up for the classes, maybe four. Four and one. Four and one. Yeah, the three heifer probably has the most muscle, like in terms of their stifle and the way she carries it down into her hawk. Like, kind of a couple main places to look for muscle in cattle is either their, their stifle and then obviously their forearm, because their forearm you can't be deceived by fat. That's one of the few places in the body that you will not be deceived by cattle laying down fat, because they do not put fat down on their forearm. So that's everything you see there is what you get. You see some muscle in their forearm, that's what it is. You're not getting tricked by any fat there. That's pretty much what it is. So. I'm sorry, I have a bird yelling at me. Okay, well. Here's a good <laughs> okay, so we'll just. Uh, yeah, well, let's go to the next page. So, which, uh, which of these use do you think is the deepest, <laughs> as the deepest body? Or has the most depth in terms of their center body. You guys can put that in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so give you a couple more seconds there to determine you think is the deepest body chief or you. Okay, so what we thought the one was maybe had the most body, the one, the one you, but then the cleanest in their lines, probably the two, but she's probably the best one in there. Like she's the best down her top line, and as <clears throat> a and you talk about who's the poorest structure, probably the number three U is probably the poorest structured one in there. Just from you know first glance here, um, but so, so we'll keep that going here. I don't know what's going on. Oh, that's the last slide. So. Okay, well, that's the last slide for the day. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Yeah. Um, if you guys have any questions, say them. So. Or put them in the chat or something like that. If you guys have any questions about anything?
No questions at all, guys? No questions, a dumb question. You can put it in the chat. Okay, that's a lie. There are dumb questions, but if it's relevant to what we, to judging, then it's not a dumb question. Could you expand on the sweep of rib and have this place? Okay. Um, like the sweep of rib is like when you analyze them from their flank and kind of down to their chest floor. And I have first kind of have like a little bit of swoop to their belly line. It just like it, it indicates depth of rib and body shape. Um, that's kind of what we talk about in um, in the in the like the sweep of the rib. And that's also when you get behind them and you look at them, it's also the rib shape. They should have some expression there. And that's also kind of part of that sweep of rib. Yeah, so sweep of rib can be the turn to the rib, whether that's from the back or right from from the side. How much actual body they have and how deep they are in their rib and their center body areas. Okay. And the next one, we are, apparently we were fantastic teachers, so that's good to hear. <laughs> okay, so uh, if we don't have any other questions, um, we'll thank the uh, judging, Lakeland judging team again for coming on and running this awesome uh webinar for us so thank you guys really appreciate it um if you guys have more questions um you can send an email to the programs team or whoever wherever you received your zoom link info from um, and we can pass it on to help get your questions answered uh, and don't forget to register for the provincial judging competition on um march 10th and the deadline for that again is march 1st so don't forget to register if you have questions about that you can email uh programs at 4hab.com um, and we can help answer your questions but other than that um i we're done for the evening i'm going to stop the recording and yeah thanks you guys for coming and thanks lakeland team for doing such an amazing job yeah.